Welcome to All Right in Sin City, a podcast about writers and writing in the Windsor, Detroit region. Your podcasters today are Sarah Jarvis, former bookseller, publishing rep, and literary festival chair, Kim Conklin, Windsor based writer and filmmaker, and me, Irene Moore Davis, author, educator, and local historian. This All Right in Sin City podcast will feature a live recording of a special event in Windsor. Today, you'll hear part one of a recent interview with award-winning fiction author Casey Platt, recorded at Biblioasis. Interviewing Casey is Windsor poet Vanessa Shields. Casey Platt is the author of the short story collection A Safe Girl to Love and the novel Little Fish, which won the Amazon Canada First Novel Award. She's also the co-editor of the anthology Meanwhile Elsewhere, Science Fiction and Fantasy from Transgender Writers, and she wrote a column on transitioning for McSweeney's Internet Tendency. Casey's essays and reviews have appeared in the New York Times, Maclean's, The Walrus, Plentitude, and the Winnipeg Free Press. She is the winner of a Lambda Literary Award for Best Transgender Fiction, and she was a past finalist for the 2015 Dane Ogilvy Prize for LGBTQ Emerging Writers. She lives in Windsor, Ontario. She's being interviewed by Windsor author Vanessa Shields. Uh, so, yeah, so thank you very much for coming. Uh, our intention today is to um, really get to know um, Casey about uh, and her, her writing life. Um, so... We're going to start, you know, uh, in childhood and work our way up. Uh, and then we're going to have time at the end also um, if you guys have questions, because that's important too. If there's something that uh, you want to ask her, we'll give you the opportunity to do so. And then, of course, there are books to be sold and signed. So uh, Casey would love to do that um, for you at the end too. So we'll make sure that we have time. Theo's going to keep me on track and let me know when it's like 8, 10, 8, 15, because Casey and I met uh, over the weekend and like, the time just flew by, and I was like, well, we're not going to have trouble having a chat. So um, she's going to keep me on track. All right. So All right. the lovely Casey Platt, born in Winnipeg, yep, uh, moved to the States, then back to Canada, ended up <coughs> in our um, grateful town here in Windsor. Um, tell us about, you know, when you first knew that you loved reading and writing and what that was like for you. There are a few answers to that. I mean, I had always read, so that's that's like before I can even remember. Um, I was an only child of two working parents on the move, and I was always like kind of in some strange spot, like in a car or a room or somewhere where I couldn't really have to do anything, but I had books, and I. Um, so that was pretty pretty natural up until, um, <clears throat> for most of my childhood. Um, for when I got turned on to writing. There was an unserious answer and a serious answer. The unserious answer is when I was eight years old, and I was like, hey, people write books that just because they, like, put words onto, like, a computer, and, like, I could do that, <laughs> so, like, that's pretty yeah. cool. I'll bet I'll become a writer. Um, and also, okay, is, did anyone read Gordon Corman? Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, kids? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, and, yeah. like, in the back of everybody's book, is like, he wrote his first book when I was 12 years old. And I was like, shit, like, <laughs> <But for you, laughs> I know, right? yeah, exactly. That was a ticket. <laughs> I remember when I was 12, I was like, oh, he wrote his first book. <laughs> the pressure. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, and then, um, but the serious answer is when I was 19, no, it's actually two serious answers to this. One, when I was, um, I was just about to turn 19, and I had dropped out of my first undergrad, it hadn't really gone so well, and I was trying to figure out what to do, and um, my mom had this work thing, she had to go away for a week, and we went together, and I just wrote the whole weekend, just like did nothing but write, and I was like, maybe I should give, maybe I should give. I think I kind of want to give this a try. Like, I don't know if this is really going to work out, but I want to at least give it a try. Second, a couple years, like a few years after that, so I had graduated undergrad. I got a BA in English. And, um, and after the story, I'm going to caveat it really hard, but I, I, will, I will tell it nonetheless. Um, I got a BA in English, and I was like, great, awesome. Like, You still loved writing, after all, I, the studying and, you know, having to read books 
uh, you know, and study them theoretically. You vastly of... overestimate the rigor of the university. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> See, I don't have maybe, my B is not I in English, so I'm like, I'm just afraid of it in general. I'm like, oh, I'm just going to hate all these books that I'm supposed to love. Many people probably but had that experience. Okay? That was that okay. was I was I was barred by that from the from the. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Okay, good. So uh, you still loved but, it. You still had a passion. Right. And good. but um, and then I was like, well, um, I'd always wanted to teach. There was this teacher training program that I could have taken in yeah. the state of Oregon, which is where I had um, uh, gone to high school and college. And I was like, well, I can do this one-year teacher training program, and that'll be cool. And then I'll like teach high school or something. And then I'll like write on the side. I'll write at night. That'll be fine. And I went to these. Um, I went to these like. Um, what do you call them? Like the presentations that teach you how to apply all the stuff. And I was like a week away from doing it, and I had this very like, um, this uh, very just sort of like, yeah moment yeah. where I was like, you know what? If I like, probably there are people who can do that, yeah. but if I do that, I'm gonna be one of those people who one day dream of being a writer, and I know that. And I and the, and the heavy caveat here is that like, I know there are tons like that was just for me. I know there are tons of people who probably could have done that. Like I think everyone has. I think every writer has their own. Like if I choose X, that means that I'm going to be a person who dreamed of being a writer. And like that X is different for a lot of people, and we probably have lots of them. But I knew that it was what, that's like what it was for me. I was like, so, um, so I didn't go, and then I started looking into writing programs, and like, which is not to say like I, you know. My writing program was great. It did a lot of good things. It did some things that weren't so great. But, like, that was not really the turning point for me. The turning point was I was like, if I go down this path, I just know myself and I know that's it. So I was so going to do this instead. Do you think that at that point you had, like, the beginnings of or at least a good foundation of a writing confidence at that point for you to know yourself well enough as a writer to know that, you know what, if I do this and I fill my time with that, then I'm probably not going to give myself the time to write. Like... Had, I guess underneath that question is just about your confidence as a writer. Which is a funny, that's, it's interesting that you put it that way, because like mm -hmm. I wouldn't have thought of that way, and I wouldn't have described myself as somebody with a lot of writing confidence mm -hmm. at the time. I feel like where what saved me was that I had, I didn't really have much writing confidence, and I didn't really have a good sense of practice, I didn't really have a good sense of craft, but I feel like I was fortunate enough to kind of have some sense of like, I don't know if potential is the right word, yeah. but again, I was just like, I know that I have to, um, I know that I've got to at least figure this out, and like, mm -hmm. if this isn't an option, if this is something that I can't do, if this is something where I'm like, no, dude, actually, this yeah. is not going to work out. You were you you gave the writing thing a shot; it did not happen. Yeah. Um, like, I know that I haven't done that yet. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Does that make any sense? Yeah. I remember when I was in undergrad, I tried first tried doing theater, which didn't work out at all. I knew a guy who had gone back to school at 35 to just because he had never done formal theater so he was just like I know that like I have to figure this out like yeah. whether I can be an actor or not like I've got to at least figure that out and I'm just gonna otherwise I'm gonna I'm gonna go to my grave thinking like right but what happened cool. exactly yeah so that was more kind of the the sense I had at the time does that make any sense yeah absolutely cool. yeah um that story that weekend that you went away with your mom and you wrote do you remember what it was that you wrote like was it a, a short story Oh, oh yes, and no one's ever seen the light of day of that stuff. But was it, do you think that it, it um, was written in, like, the Casey Plett-esque sort of style that you continue to write today? Because I think it's wild that, like, you just chose that weekend of all the things you could do at that age while your mom was giving you freedom or whatever and you were by yourself that you decided <laughs> to write and, like, not stop writing. That shows some sort of love for, the you know, writing and dedication to practice that you just did that the whole time? Um, I think more what happened is that I had this realization that like this is something that like if I don't do I like yeah. like it needs to happen. I don't really enjoy the act of writing. It's not really something that like causes me any great joy. Um, <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna have to experiment on that. Okay. Is it but it is yeah. something where I feel like I have to do this, and if I yeah. don't do this, I'll feel bad about myself. And when okay. I are in, in like a certain, not in a superficial way, in a very yeah. like deep sense. Yeah. And if when I do do it, then I feel like something has happened that has made me at peace. Yeah. There's a relief. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So go me. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Says so the artist, of course. Yeah. Um, so, do you think that? So one of the things that you do in your um, writing life is read other people's work support other writers, share other writers, review other writers' books. 
Um, do you think that you learned, you know, how to read and critique a book while you were uh, at Columbia, and that enabled you to be able to be perhaps a different reviewer in that way because you had? Okay, go. <laughs> yes, yes, you know absolutely. The question? Sorry, yes, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that like reading other people's work, especially reading it with a critical eye, yeah. whether that is to review it or whether it's just like a friend that you want to give sure. feedback, I feel like that was like incredibly key and helpful for, and not just me, but I feel like everybody I know who's had that experience has said the same thing, you know? Like, if you are like, let's say there is like a person in your life that you care about and that person is like, here is some art, help me make it better. And you're like, oh, buddy. Yeah. Like, that's, that's, yeah. um, and to do that honestly and incisively and productively is right. a very difficult thing. And like, there's no way you come out of that not making your own art better. Right. I mean, it sounds kind of like wooey. Um, I, uh, I spent a decade in the Pacific Northwest. I'm always wary about using kind of language like this but like yeah. really like you know when you all when you like you work together it like makes everything yeah. you know but no I mean like like seriously like um, the act of sort of being in community with other writers yeah. and helping other people mm -hmm. and trying to help other people with their writing and mm -hmm. like having those people in your life who can do the same to you I mean yeah. for both of my books for A Safe World Love and Little Fish both of those did have editors both for sale here tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs> yep. Um, you said they both, had editors, yeah. They had yep, editors, yep, yep. but there were also for each of them at least a dozen, dozen little fish had a lot. Um, like if not other just, folks not who just, read it. Not just one or two, but yeah. several people who I was able to give it to, and they were able to understand what was happening. Yeah. And tell me really honestly. M many people, by the way, who are like not professional writers yeah. and who are not, you know, not lucky enough like myself. They're to readers, talk to a which is yeah, great. Exactly. Like unattached is good. It's good right, to have exactly. just a good old fashioned reader to give you the heart and soul of what they're understanding. Right. Exactly. Then someone who's got that editor in their eye who just like can't turn it off. I know totally. And and I yeah. had and some of those people too are like, well, I don't know if you're like. Like, you are a friend and you know books. Like, just please tell me how you think about it, to be honest. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, like, I was so, and, like, neither of those books could have been what they were if I had not right. met those people. They really so, were. just a little bit on that, then, I guess, how is it for you when you're, you know, again, you probably had practice while you were doing all your seminars and, and your classes at school, but, you know, receiving feedback from anybody, um, especially if it's differing. So, like, say somebody said, I really love Wendy, who's the, the lead character in Little Fish, uh -huh. and then someone else was like... I don't really like Wendy, and here's why. Like, what did you do when you came up with kind of conflicting responses that to is anything, a, like any of the stories or any of the? Oh, writing? that's an excellent question because now it gives yeah. me a good way, a good short, productive way to talk about the some of the unhelpful things in my writing program. Okay, um, fantastic. <laughs> I mean, there. I feel like so. <clears throat> one of the quirks um, of going to my writing program when I did, which was 2009 to 2012 was that I was an out transsexual at the time, and it was at a time where like that would be like, okay, so I understand it's a thing that happens, but yeah. people, so and that was fine, where maybe it wouldn't have been just a few years beforehand, yeah. but also people didn't really understand how to, how to process sure. art about that stuff. Got it. And so I got a lot of feedback that was, whenever that was specifically trying to deal with that issue, that like wasn't yeah. very helpful. Yeah. And so I feel like I learned very early on to like sort of separate, like okay, what you're telling, what like side A of this critique is really helpful, Yeah. There's also a side B where, like, you don't get it, and yeah. maybe I'm just going to put it over here. Got it. Yeah. And, I, and I mean, to an extent, that is just a synecdoche of what every writer and artist has to deal with, right? Because, like, yeah. not all feedback is helpful. Not everything right. is going to be... If you... I had a teacher once uh, who said that, like, you know, if you take every single critique somebody gives you, and you try to incorporate it all, that's 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 writing yeah. by committee. That's yeah. that's Time Magazine, you know? Like, yeah. Um, yeah. So I feel like I was lucky enough to have a sense early on of, like knowing how to like under knowing when a critique was like oh crap they just fixed my book like thanks yeah. and when to be like you know i know where this is coming from and maybe it's not maybe i'm just going to leave it over here yeah. does that make any sense yeah mm -hmm. absolutely that's yeah. good i like i find that hard to do i'm i'm always super sensitive to everything everybody says so mm -hmm. i always like you know want to try and incorporate everything but a lot of times it doesn't work and like right. i as a writer, I like I feel like there are certain um, characters or choices that I make that I'm like are untouchable. Yeah. Even if like ten people said they hate it, 
and I love it and like everybody says it but I love it it's like part of what the soul of the story is yeah. that's when it's hard to be like oh my god all these people don't like it but this is the one thing that I don't want to change so, it's so sometimes hard, right? that happens too and, and I think you just have to sort of like that speaks a little bit to the practice of the confidence of your own writing right and like knowing your writer's voice and being able to cultivate that as you as you go totally, but it's, right? it can be jarring like I don't know if you ever felt jarred when you were getting some of the feedback and just were like oh, oh shit my goodness, what all am the I time saying? and still that part out um you know like, I've been it could be so like uh, I, don't, I don't believe in writer's block so I can you can tell me what you think about that but it's not it's definitely a blockage on some level to sort of have to step back and be like okay what am I going to do about what everybody's saying right I mean it's so hard to modulate right because either yeah. either you're like oh like they're right everything's bad this is terrible <laughs> I'm terrible my life is sure. terrible I'm a bad person yeah. right you know and it's yeah. also be like well whatever they just don't get it so yeah. like I mean, being able to modulate and sort of like yeah. hold these things in one yeah. space is so difficult yeah. you know um, time helps leaving it, it alone also helps totally completely. so let's talk about okay so your first collection is a collection of short stories um a couple of which the short stories you had like are years old like you were writing them for a while or you've had had them written for a while mm -hmm. um so maybe talk about um the choice of what short stories that you decided to submit into the manuscript um and then after that we can talk about the difference in uh, genre because so the first one is a collection of short stories and yes. then you shifted to a novel so how so, you made that transition and and under like knew okay this this is not a short story this is a novel yeah absolutely so when yeah. I when I was writing my first book of short stories to save the love there's a few I think there was a point it's actually funny there was a very much of a turning point where there was a course of like over three years where I had like written a story here a story there and I want to say about a third of what's currently in that book had been written and then there was a thing where I was like I have a book of short stories I know how this wants to come together and I like and I really love like connected linked short stories yeah. where it's yeah. like it reads you know it's almost like a it's almost like an like an album that holistically like you can. Uh. You know, it's made of yeah, a separate Yeah, there's a thread even. that yeah, pulls exactly. all through, yeah. And there's, again, I think it was about a third, I had done about a third of those stories, mm -hmm. and I was like, this is like, this is what I'm doing. And then I wrote the rest of two thirds very quickly, I think like within a year. Wow. Um, the first draft of it. Anyway. Got it. Um, how I decided to write, and there, there were some like, few short stories that had I had written earlier that I was like, these aren't great, these don't quite fit here. Yeah. Um, and I'm really, and you know, it's funny, I was actually, at the time, I remember being like, well, I should put it in anyway. I mean, I wrote it, and published it, but I was yeah. like, and I'm so glad I resisted that temptation. Kind of yeah. like, you know, because you love all your babies, but you can't include that. all your babies. Oh, I don't love all my babies. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So, um, and some of them are shorter than others. Some of them yeah. are quite long. Like, mm -hmm. could absolutely, I felt like you could have just kept writing and writing. Um, Thank you. And you, you mentioned when we chatted last time, just that like. Like, you just knew, like, this one was done, so I'm going to stop. That, that so happened... So tell me a little bit about that, too, that, that you just innately know, okay, this one's done. That ha yeah. Um, yeah. With the exception of one story, that was that was what happened with all of them. And for me, there was just this, like... Um, you know, there would be there would always be points in my process where I'm like, well, I'm not really sure what comes next. I'm going to have to think about that. Or, yeah. like, I'm not, like, I don't really see it. And there was a point where, like, for each story, I was like, oh, well, like, what if... What nothing comes next because the story's done. Got it, sure. And I just listened to every point where I was like, well, what could, well, I was like, well, maybe it's done. Yeah. Um, Did you do that and then start something else and then come back and write a little bit more or still knew, okay, that one's done? I would often like edit in the middle and get some, but yeah. in terms of like, this is the end of this. Yeah. Um, that was always pretty clear to me. And like, um, cause I would always have these, um, sort of movies in my head of like this is what happens afterwards like this yeah. is what happens to Sophie after this happens this is what happens to Zoe after this thing is done but I was like I know what happens to these characters but for what's actually happening on the page this ends here wow. um like the the last bit the, the penultimate nice. story in a safe book good word thank you very much <laughs> no big deal um, <laughs> um I had this whole which is about um this uh this young girl and her mom um, I had this whole, um, it ends with the, two, with the girl and the mom going out to look for this, um, oh, it's far um, <laughs> anyway, 
and I had this whole like vision afterwards of like what happens and a thing happens to the mom and, the kid, and then yeah. and I still believe that happens you know in terms of like the cosmic sense of where the story goes but yeah. there was a point where I wrote a final scene and I was actually like oh like this is actually the ending because this is the important thing this is the thing that yeah. I want to be on did you study the short story form when you were at school, like either in your undergrad or uh, afterwards? I took a couple like fiction classes when I was okay. undergrad. In graduate school, I actually was in nonfiction workshops the whole time. Okay. So no. So what drew you to the, that uh, format? Um, I there was a call out for submissions for Topside Press, who published my first book. They had called it. They didn't call it submission for submissions of short fiction. Yeah. And I was struggling with a bunch of nonfiction right at the time. I was like, I'll write a short story, why not? Like, yeah. sure, that sounds great. I get to make crap up. Like, yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, and I had liked writing fiction when I was younger, and I hadn't for years. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I keep, I had kept trying to write this nonfiction project, and I kept banging my head against the wall, and it just felt awful. Like, like you know when you're working on something, and you yeah. can really feel yourself making yourself do it in, like, the not productive way? Yep. You know what I mean, right? Yeah, yeah sometimes I'm writing, and I'm like, bored and then I'm like right. uh oh if I'm bored the reader's gonna be like <laughs> right throw it in the fire exactly oh yeah I you know just feel yourself like yeah it's you know? too like, hard mm-hmm. yeah yeah so that was happening okay. a lot <laughs> over a long period of time and to like and I found myself writing short fiction as a way to like well I'm gonna take a break from this project and I'll do this instead nice um and that ended up being sort of this the the thing that I had wanted to say with a nonfiction project which is shelter everything God will never yep. see the light of day will, I will not ask you any questions about that thank you very much um a lot of sort of like the energy if I can yeah. put it that way or the um the fire behind that ended yeah. up being better expressed through this book so I found its awesome. way instead I will say, and I, cause I think this is a, an important process question too, is that even though we will not mention the nonfiction that you wrote, you did say that you needed to write it. Like you needed to get it out of your system in that way. So like if there's any kind of advice questions that any kind of writers have, it is that like sometimes you just need to get something out of you. It may not be something that you're going to submit. It may not be even great but you need to physically get it out of your person and oh yeah you definitely. recognize that with your thesis and other stories that will never see the light of day except probably when you die i'm sure somebody will dig them up uh, yes. but you won't <laughs> so it will be okay then um but yeah so like She's that is so <laughs> like sometimes you just need to get the stuff out and then but you, like you said the energy the sort of soul message is still there the fire is still there and that can be expressed in a different way so you still get to tell that story but it's in a different version yeah i mean like i think that like you know it's easy to sort of think about you know so much time you spend on like projects that don't work or like things that you shelve when it's like when really it's um um if i can if i can be indulged in metaphors i mean it's kind of like well it's i don't know it's like exercising or it's like wait what's that <laughs> I know, right? Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> or you know, as someone else told me, and it's yeah. like think about learning just like just yeah. like keep showing up to your job, just keep yeah. showing up to your job, you know. So like, yeah. sure, I've spent hours, hundreds of hours on work, as I'm sure you have as well, yeah. on work that will never be public, and Lord knows it shouldn't. But like, yeah. that was still valuable. That was so valuable yeah. in. We're still being showing up and doing yeah. work, and right. building the your work- voice and your craft. Right, the work that gets published yeah. is the tip of the iceberg, where the iceberg yeah. is the thing that you construct, like, snowflake by ice yeah. flake or yeah. something under the water. Yeah. While you can't breathe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you transition to the the novel then? Did it start as a short story, or were these characters, was Wendy, like, in your mind, just sort of waiting? Um, so... Um, the, lo- the longest short story in my first book, I said, Book of Love, called Not Bleak. Yeah. That was the last short story that I wrote, and I remember that one feeling like... So as I was writing it, I knew very clearly, like, okay, this is going in the, in the book, but that was the only story in there where I kind of felt like, I feel like I could just kind of keep going if I yeah. wanted to, I really could. And I almost kind of think of that story as almost being, like the first chapter in what that novel could have been yeah. or something. Yeah. But I was really intrigued that I felt that way. Like I said, like every other thing, I was like, yeah. no, I think this ends because this is where this ends, and I didn't necessarily feel that way. Um... And so when I started writing Little Fish, I had like about, I had like a few other things kicking around. And eventually there was a point where I had like 30, 40 pages. And I was like, I think I feel that way again. I think I feel yeah. the way that I did last time. This feels like a novel. I can see this being the novel. Um, was that daunting at all to you? At the time in your life, did you have time to write a novel? Like what was the context of the rest of your life at that point? 
Um, Can you was, give us a little snapshot of it? It was pretty exciting, actually. Like, I, um, I felt excited that I had, like, another book project to work on, okay. you know? Like, I, it had been six months after my... F- six months? Maybe like, four. Okay. It had been, like, four months after my first book had come out, and so I kind of felt like I'm, like, feel ready to, like, do something else. I don't know, when I... Like, before my first book came out, I was like, oh, man. Actually, for both of my books, I was like... I don't even know if I want to write anymore. Like, I like this took so much out of me yeah. to make this thing. Like, it took so much out of my body. It took yeah. so much out of my soul. Like, I'm a, you have, I write really sad stuff, by the way. So, like, I <laughs> apologize. <laughs> um, but, like, making those things was so intense that I just felt at the end of it. Like, like, when I, like, sent it off, I was like, oh, like, I don't, yeah. I don't even know if I have anything else to say. I don't even know if I want to, like, you know, yeah. all that stuff. And so when Little Fish started happening, I Little Fish started happening. It was exciting because yeah. I was like, I think actually there's okay, there's, there's one other thing I want to do at least. Yeah. Um, and then of course it took years to bang it out, and that wasn't quite as exciting. Yeah. Um, and I was fortunate at the time, you know, I was a mixture of like part-time retail and freelancing, so I had a lot more flexibility in terms of hours of my life. Okay. And what was your writing practice like? Did you get up in the morning and write? For- before you went to work, or was it sort of sporadic, but you wrote, you know, pretty often, almost like, every I'm like day? Def- I'm, like, definitely, like, a mid-morning person, like, okay. like, to me, the ideal writing time is, like, between 10 and noon. Nice. Okay. Um, I, I used to write in the evenings more when I was younger, I don't so much anymore. I mean, I do still definitely believe in, like, when, you know, like, when I have ideas, when I have thoughts, of getting them down as soon as possible, you know, yeah. especially, like, you know a thing, right, where you're, like, about to go to sleep, and you're like, oh, this is how this happened, you're like, yeah. I'll remember in the morning. Yeah. It's gone. <laughs> no, ever, never, yeah. never, never. Um, but um, I would say then and now, like yeah. mostly, like I'm not an early bird. I'm not an early morning person, and like I have to take a, you know, when I get up, I've got to let the brain boot up a little bit. Yeah. But are you um, an outliner, uh, or like any? Do you do any kind of prep work, or do you, you sit down and the story just? comes out of you oh none, none of those things none of those things <laughs> um i guess like i um i feel like every time i try to do that stuff where i'm like yeah. there's no line or like well yeah. i have written that like this will happen with this part so now i must fill the part in like yeah. that just always that that always ends up with writing that for me is boring got it and again, this is this is once again, this is not to say yeah. that like this doesn't work yeah, for anybody else, for sure. but I know it, it's how That's it works for process, me. Yeah. yeah. So um Do you know um, at least a little bit where you're going? Do you know your ending? Like did you know how Little Fish was gonna end? That's a good question, because I would I would have said like if you had asked me that three years ago yeah. when I was writing, I would have said, Yeah, I think I do, and then it changed on me. Yeah. I think what I do always have is like and what I'll often do, actually, for both stories or the novel, is have like parts of the end scene written. I like I'm not exactly sure what happens, but I have vague sense of like yeah. like I know that these two people will meet, and I know that this will be said, and it will be devastating. Got it. You know, like I know this is building towards this thing. Cool. And lots of other stuff about the ending and what happens I, has kind of yet to fill in, but I, yeah. I kind of at least know. Um, mm-hmm. um, like the direction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. not like completely aimless and meandering. Yeah. And that I would say is like pretty, because I'm totally like a, when I took a screenwriting class, they call this like the tree method or the forest method. Oh. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Where like the forest is when like you map everything out and the tree is like, here's a tree yeah. and here's a tree and here's a tree. Yeah. And I'm more of a tree person. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, it is definitely helpful for me to have some kind of sense of like a direction where I'm coming up. Sweet. Does that answer your question? Yeah, Absolutely. Talk to us about certain themes that come up, like weather. The cold is a is it like a character in Little Fish and a character in some of the short stories. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's based on like there's a scene in Little in Little Fish where I was like, first of all, I was like I'm kind of glad I'm reading this in the summer because it's definitely a winter <laughs> book to read because it take it's cold. It takes place in the winter and like you could. But I was like feeling so cold when I was reading it, the part where it's not really giving anything away, but there's a scene where the lead, the main character is like walking outside and it's like 40 below. Um, she's drunk, which probably helped, but like the, I know the cold that you were writing about where you're just like your body and brain, there's a disconnect. Like the only thing that's connected is your brain is telling your legs to go mm-hmm. because if you felt how cold you were, you would like die. So I don't know if you felt that also. <laughs> 
I'm, uh, we had a good laugh when, when we talked about this too, but I'm like, my, when I read things, I'm a literal, literal reader, and I'm always like, envision the author, especially if I know them, as the character in the book. So like, I got the book, I met Casey, I'm like, okay, so Casey's Wendy, so I'm reading the book, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm so nervous to meet her, oh my god, what, did she do all this? Casey, did you, so we got through that, you know, which was nice, but, um, so I, th the question then is, how much of write what you know, and write what you lived, um, comes into your, to your work, and did, like, the weather aspect of it, I mean, you lived in Winnipeg, it's pretty cold there in the winter, um, you know, how does, how did that come into your book, and then, um, including also, like, drinking insects. Because there's a lot of that. In there. That's a nice little like right, right, yeah. right at the end there. Yeah. Um, and you know, like I write about sex too, so yeah. I'm I was like fascinated and turned on and educated like throughout the whole book, which I really appreciated. Like I I liked that. I liked that. There's all sorts of new things that I've learned, and uh, um, I just appreciate the ease. Like it's not like oh here comes a sex scene. Um, and it's there's like a weird disconnect that you you know you're reading a sex scene. It's like nope, these are the characters and this is what they're doing. They're having sex now. Great. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I enjoyed that part of your writing style too. That there it wasn't like well I won't say it was uncomfortable because some of it was because it was like new stuff. But I was like whoa that can happen. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> sweet. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, like everything, I, I think it's because you de developed the character so well that I was going through it with them and um, felt so connected that I just went through it with them. It was hard. Um, um, Emilcar, he, you said you read it in like 24 hours. Yeah. It took me a little bit longer to read. Um, I mean, I had this date. I know I wanted to finish it by today, which I did, but some of it was a little bit like harder for me to get through just because it was, I was like struggling with the characters and I needed like to put it down for a day to sort of like ooh, um, lift up a bit and then I could go back in and then you throw another doozy at me and I'd be like, oh my God, I need another day. But anyway, that's a really long question. So the question originally is, talk to us about the themes that you write about, like whether, like sex, like drinking, like how does that come in and how is it related to your own life if you want to share that part now. Yeah, I mean, so I'm, ha well, I'm happy to, like, I, I think the whole question of, like, writing what you know is yes. something that is often oversimplified, but it's, like, a good question and something to, like, that I enjoy talking about. So mm -hmm. I think that um, on a quotidian level, like, yes, lots of things in both those books are, like, a, a melange of, like, things that have either happened to me or, like, things that happened to me, but then I'm like, well, what if this had happened instead? Like, fuck. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> and, like... Yeah. Well, like, or like, this is something that I saw happen to a yeah. loved one, or this is something yeah. that I have, you know, seen or a lot of people experience. Yeah. Um, but that's not the whole, the whole wisdom of write what you know for me doesn't quite capture that. Because I mean, and there's a lot of things in both those books that have never happened to me mm -hmm. and are like not things I've experienced. But I do think that there is the reason write what you know, um, in fiction, which is by definition writing about things that aren't true, right. the reason why that is valuable is not because of something so simple as like, well, a thing happened in your life, so you put it on paper, and you yeah. change the names, and you're like, gravy. Um, the reason that is meaningful and helps is when right we can know from a certain kind of emotional truth. Right. So I'm going to back up to my first book for a bit. One yeah. of the first, one of the most like. Um, of all the things I've written, one of the things that has seemed to have like provoked so much of a reaction in um, readers over the years has been a story about a depressed girl who lives with her cat who talks to her. Yeah. Um, and there's also like there's other stuff that happens in the story, um, but was so obviously like like by definition that is not a thing that I've <laughs> experienced. Um, <laughs> and actually, lots of other and um, but. So many people seem to have connected with that story yeah. because of certain sort of like emotional truths that sure. I hope went into it, yeah. um, and that that was very real. Yeah. So see, I told you, like that's. <laughs> <they're not laughs> um. So that's where I think right what you know is helpful. You know, yeah. like to take a um, um, again a more quotidian example. So, um, plenty of the main characters in Little Fish, Winnie and Sophie both have a lot of um, surface level similarities to myself. Yeah. 
one thing that he doesn't is that Winnie the protagonist has lived in Winnipeg all her life, mm -hmm. and I haven't. Like, yeah. I was born there, but I've actually lived there, like, far less than half of my life. Okay. Um, so on one level, that's like, I don't know what it's like to live in the same five square miles. Mm -hmm. How did you know all the streets? Did you, like, have Google Maps up and... Because it, I wrote, I wrote like, you know the area, oh, well, I'm assuming you know the area well, the streets that they were on and... Well, one of the things, actually, I mean, like, so I lived there when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, and in a lot of these circumstances of Wendy's childhood, mm -hmm. and then I moved away when I was very young, mm -hmm. and I moved back as an adult, and Winnipeg never changes ever. So, like, <laughs> um, and it, it was, was wild insane. how many things at, like, that point of my life, which, like, was never, no one took photos, like, yeah. nobody also really, in my life, I never really wanted to talk about, stuff that was yeah. happening during that point, was, like, all, like, viscerally came back to me. It was like, oh, right, like, I, this was actually a part of my life. I wasn't yeah. making it up. I wasn't imagining it. So yeah. a lot of that feeling went into Little Fish, even though that is not an experience that any of those characters have. Does that make any sense? Yeah. 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 And as far as drinking and sex, I mean, like, I religion don't know. Religion, too. I, there's lots of good lots, lots of spirituality, religion, yes. religion yeah. um, in there, too. But again, like, not in your face and not, like, preachy and not, like, yeah. this is the point where we're talking about religion. It just sort of, like, slipperily, like, Little Fish, like, it just, it's just... Like flowed bit. right in there you know thank you I mean yeah. I feel like I don't know I feel like I've been frustrated so often like growing up reading books where mm -hmm. it was like and this is where the edgy person yeah. talks about <laughs> yeah. like x-rated things yeah Woo. yeah um or you know any other things that are um salacious yeah. whereas I feel like in as someone who mostly writes realist fiction, I mean, like, I feel like in real life those things just happen, yeah. and they happen, and the next, and, like, ten minutes later you're, like, at the 7-Eleven getting a coffee, you know? Yeah. And, like, that is not really, and I've always been frustrated yeah. by how fiction writers haven't, I, I've read a lot of fiction where mm -hmm. that's not, there's this sort of, like, this sheen or this gloss on yeah. things. I mean, I read Philip Roth as a teenager, which was obviously a terrible choice. <laughs> um, and, but, um, not that he's not a good writer, just, you know, yeah. I, I, I was, I was too young. Um, <laughs> but... I think I was always interested in seeing what it would look like if fiction reflected sort of the mundane reality. Yes. Where mundanity and salaciousness collide. Right. Does that make any sense? Yep. Yeah. That was Vanessa Shields interviewing author Casey Plett at Biblioasis. Look for part two of this interview in our next podcast. Thanks for joining us. Look for more episodes of All Right in Sin City wherever you listen to podcasts. Or check out our website, allrightinsincity.com. For information and announcements of new podcasts, sign up to our email list or follow us on Facebook and Twitter. <laughs>